So if you're going to be living afloat, what sort of boat do you want? What boat suits you? Do you want a proper fixed houseboat or uh, do you want to be on a river boat or a canal boat? Should it be wide, be more narrow? What are the questions to ask and how should you deal with boat builders and brokers? Of course, the simple answer is that you want the best boat in the world. If you're going to live on, if you're going to be a happy live on board, then you need the best boat for your particular needs at the price you can afford. And that won't necessarily mean the latest star with all the newest high-tech twiddly bits. The choices are as varied as the types of people who want to make a boat their home. And thankfully, the price range is wide enough to fit most budgets. So where do you start? Well, the first question is not what sort of boat, but what type of boater? Are you someone who just wants to live afloat in one place and never float off into the sunset? Or perhaps you have to have a base during the working week but still want to travel wherever you, whenever you can. Either way, you'll need a permanent mooring where liverboards are accepted. And it's probably more important to find the place you're going to stay before you identify the boat you need. So are you confident that you can deal with the perpetually changing landscape and winter weather conditions uh, that are faced by the true continuous cruiser? Or will you want permanent moorings to which you can return and perhaps hook up a landline? Finding winter moorings is not too difficult these days, with marinas springing up all over the place. But if you really want to be out there all the time, you should give serious consideration to getting a boat with a diesel generator, or at least an efficient system of providing the power you need for long winter nights. Are you the sort of boater who lives alone with a partner or has frequent visitations from family? It all has a bearing on the size of the boat you need to buy. I know single people who manage quite happily on a 30 or 40 foot boat and even couples who find 45 or 50 foot enough for their needs. We've always had grandchildren on regular visits so a 58 foot gives us places to sleep and we can sleep about seven people and it doesn't seem an extravagance. Bear in mind this will be your home perhaps for years to come so you need to feel you can fit in all you need from the, your current lifestyle, the technology, the kitchen equipment, the books, that's my real downfall, and the other essentials. Which leads me to the question of whether you can really live in a metal box, roughly six foot by six foot by say 60 foot long. If you really can't manage the standard narrow boat, of course you've got the option of a wide beam or even the Dutch barge, which could still cruise the wide canals and rivers, although you would have to choose the northern or southern wide canals and either put it on a lorry to travel between the two parts of the system or risk a sea crossing. There is no wide canal link between north and south and of course you'll never be able to sample the joys of the Shropshire Union, Trenton Mersey or most of the Birmingham canal navigations. Okay, so you now know what sort of boat, but should it be new or second hand? Once again, the answer depends on what sort of person you are and how much cash you can produce or borrow. Vessels are VAT exempt under the current HM Revenue and Customs ruling, providing they are for residential use and they are your main home. Although this has been the subject of some controversy in the past, with the government department apparently unsure whether a floating home should be treated on equal footing with a land-based one. The sky's the limit if you have the money, a new purpose-built Dutch barge style, more than 60 foot long, 13 foot 6 wide, 180 horsepower engine, a big 6 kilovolt gener generator, uh, offering 4 or 6 berths in ensuite cabins, full central heating, washer, dryer, navigation equipment for the sea, and it'll set you back, I don't know, best part of 300,000, and the price goes upwards as you improve the spec. On the plus side, of course, you can cruise the rivers and canals of the UK and much of Europe with a beast like that. For about half that, you can get one of the better builders to fit out a 60-foot narrowboat with all you need to live aboard and a very similar spec to the Dutch barge, minus a pair of ensuite double bedrooms. Drop another 40 grand again and you can get a, a standard fit-out 50-foot boat on a new shell. 
although you may need to add some of the things you need to live on board full time. All these prices are very approximate and depend to a large extent on whether you're buying new off the shelf or getting a truly bespoke design from the shell upwards. Business is slack these days, so very much a buyer's market in both the new and second-hand boats uh, area. So you can use a bit of bargaining power. Size is obviously the main determining factor, with narrow boats costing like, around £1,400-£1,500 a foot at the cheaper end, although you generally get what you pay for. If you decide to buy new, make sure you choose your builder with great care. Builders go bust every year and many leave customers with real problems. Look at their history, find out what they've built before, whether they use the best quality shells, whether they have experience in producing the type of boat you want, and above all, talk to the owners of boats they've recently produced and get them to tell you about their problems. Once you pick a builder, use the standard British Marine Federation staged payment contract and agree the final design in writing, preferably at a face-to-face -face meeting, including all the specs for the steel, the equipment to be fitted and the materials used. Agree a fixed price and a realistic delivery date, and if possible, build in penalty clauses for delays, as you may find you've sold your house and you've got nowhere to go. It's how it happened. Don't make an agreement that asks for large deposits, advance payments or cash in hand and make sure the ownership of the shell and everything in it is properly transferred to you, preferably as it's paid for. This means you can extract it from the boatyard's administrators if the worst happens and the firm does go to the wall. Above all, make sure you visit your boat regularly as it's being built, not, uh, not always by appointment, to check that you're getting what you asked for even where it doesn't show. Finally, although new boats are covered by the European Recreational Craft Directive, this is a self-assessment scheme operated by the boat builder. So thinking out, uh, think about getting a boat safety certificate survey done before you accept delivery. I would only add that my experience suggests that unless you've owned several boats before and even lived on board, it's almost inevitable that soon after you start cruising your new boat, you'll want to change something something about the design or the equipment, as experience is always a, a better guide to real needs. The halfway house, of course, is to buy a new shell, perhaps as a sail away with an engine and basics fitted, and to fit it out for yourself. I have no little or no expertise in that area, uh, but I would only observe that such projects often seem to take years rather than months. Most of us will buy second hand and the choices are just as wide and varied and prices are not as substantially different. Uh, new vehicles, when you buy a car, depreciate by 20% or more as soon as the price is paid. And something similar, though not quite as bad, uh, does when you, buy, when you buy a boat. So when you find a boat, Make sure it meets, if not exceeds, your needs and it's been fitted out by somebody who understands the canals better than you do at this stage of your experience. You'll decide whether you prefer portholes or windows, just warmth versus light really, cruiser sterns or traditional boats that make the most of the length available, hatches, how many, whether where you want the main living area, the bow or the stern, uh, do you want a multi-fuel fire or a diesel central heating? Uh, um, gas is certainly too expensive for a liverboard. Certain things will always be desirable and are sometimes hard to find, especially on newer boats where the emphasis has been on giving the impression of light and space. But the first is storage. Every nook and cranny on a liverboard boat will become home for some essential. Always ask when you're going, where you're going to hang your clothes, store your underwear, and keep your saucepans. The second is ventilation. Can you get a good flow of air through the boat? This is important in both winter and summer. In winter you balance the heat against the external temperature and bad ventilation results in condensation and damp. In the summer you need to avoid being slowly roasted in your metal tube. Once again, there are some basic guidelines when you're buying second hand. These days prices are always negotiable and some brokers like estate agents gather business by offering 
the seller high prices and then bowing to the need to accept a lower offer. If you're going to live on board, you're buying a home as well as a boat and you wouldn't buy bricks and mortar without a survey. Make sure you get it done out of the water by a surveyor without links to the broker or the seller. You need to know that the hull beneath your feet is sound and likely to remain so. ex hire boats are often good value buy for would-be liverboards, although some hire companies now dispose of the boats after only a short life, which leads me to wonder whether their boats are still built to the same high standards as in the past. But if you're buying an ex hire boat or any vessel that's been in use for many years, I would advise specifically asking the surveyor to check the outside edges of the bottom plate and the bottom six inches of the side plates for wear and to guarantee the thickness in those areas. Hire boats especially tend to wear down the base plate along the outside nine inches or so, mostly on the starboard side. And that's where the plate grinds against the bottom when passing another, another vessel. I would also advise on insisting on a new boat safety certificate when you buy it with a, a personal checker that all the onboard equipment is working properly. My current boat had a faulty cooker, was failed by the boat safety and I had to have a shouting match with the broker to get it replaced. Above all, when you finally move on board, it's really important that you feel you have the best boat in the world for you. It may be old, it may be new, but it will be your home. Hope you love living on board.